Space enthusiasts everywhere, the wait is finally over. Sierra Space and their security has cleared the footage that was taken, much of it while I was there during my tour, and now I can share it all with you in this second part of my Sierra Space tour. If you haven't seen the first part of this, stop this video, check the description, and you will find a link to the first part of the tour. But if you've seen the first part, get ready to see Dream Chaser as you have never seen it before, and as far as I know, this information was only shared with one other journalist before it was shared with me, so chances are you are seeing this for the first time ever. But I also need you to do me two favors. Number one, subscribe to Sierra Space's YouTube channel. It's the least we can do for sharing all of this exclusive information with us. And number two, please subscribe to this channel if you haven't already as part of the 100K challenge. What is the 100K challenge? Well, I'm not gonna waste your time with it here, but it's linked in the description. And let's just put it this way, there's a lot at steak. So without further gilding the lily and with no further ado, let us meet Dream Chaser in person along with Shooting Star right now. So obviously we have shooting stars sitting right here. Can you tell us about capabilities, advantages over other cargo delivery systems, etc.? And it's maybe its capabilities as an independent space station of its own. I've heard about that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, Shooting Star does have an amazing amount of capabilities, especially when it is partnered up with our uncrewed Dream Chaser. We call it our UDC or Tenacity, right? The reason that we uh, take advantage of both of those systems is one gives us that return capability that NASA desires, but NASA also desires a disposal capability. And so this gives them both of their desired requirements. They generate trash just like we do. So with our cargo module, that's the one thing that we can jettison off, get rid of some of the cargo that they don't need anymore or any of their payloads, and we still have all of that capability to return Dream Chaser to the runway and get the rest of their items that they do want to have access to. Um, you're right, we do have the solar arrays. We have thermal control on that. So there are a lot of opportunities to repurpose the cargo or the shooting star um, to go off and perform other missions depending on what the customer's needs are. Right. Can, and by the way, I, the scale of this thing, I don't know if it's obvious, but as you can see from the steps going up to that thing, this is a big cargo module, guys. This thing is really large. And that, in many ways, is another advantage, right, is the fact that you have the capability. Don't you have external pods that you can put we on do. as well? desire for both pressurized and, un and unpressurized payloads. So what they ask us to do is we have different s configurations of that cargo module where we can put that external cargo, either take it up to the ISS or bring it back home. NASA does make us aware of what they want to take up or bring home for every single mission, so we can outfit that shooting star very specific to their needs on that mission. Thank you. Yeah, and we're going to see the cargo module too in, a, in a, the mock-up of it in a different room, right. so it'll give you a much more visual of the size. The pictures never do it justice. It is, it is neat to see the real thing. Yep. But yeah, it'll be neat to, to get right up next to that. All right, let's head out this way then. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you look at how large this vehicle is, um, when May you... I approach the... Sure, the, you can go up to the, the platform, sure. So, at least to, so once again, I'm 6'2 and 250 pounds. <laughs> As you can see, <laughs> this thing's big. It carries a lot of cargo, and so you got that and that when you're talking about re resupplying the ISS. Pretty impressive. Yeah, no, it is. It's... It's a good-sized vehicle, provides up a lot of capability for us on up mass. 
Um, you can see if you look in there, there's a tunnel that our crew members are gonna float in and out of whenever they get to the International Space Station. Um, when we berth with the International Space Station, it's this portion of the vehicle that will mate. That narrow down part towards the front of our shooting star is the part that mates up with our uh, tenacity vehicle. And then you just have about 15 feet and another 30 feet of cargo capability to take up there. Now what you're looking at here is this piece of structure rotates our cargo module so the way we load and unload that cargo or at least we practice in here is you're going to load into these lockers and then rotate the entire cargo module and then load the next set of lockers. That way we're never lifting anything over our head and we can just properly strap down all that cargo. At what point is there any way to simulate an actual, I mean they simulate you know the microgravity situations at NASA all the time. Is there any way to simulate a cargo load in a microgravity water kind of situation with these kinds of things or, or do you not have that? So we haven't considered that need right now. What we will do is we train all of our crew members down at Houston, um, including the, the cr astronaut crew that will be on board, and we just work with them to practice where everything needs to go, how to load it, but we don't so much, it's pretty simple design, those are lockers, don't really need a zero-g environment to figure out how to put it in there. Right. Now, I have one other question. Your one person spacecraft, your self-contained environment, environment, I don't know how much you know about that, that the, apart from the orbital reef, those little bitty spaceships that they have, are their arms and all that sort of thing, Is that, are those going to be configured to work in conjunction with the equipment on this? Are you kind of planning for that eventuality? Or Absolutely. We want the same look and feel for our Dream Chaser, even as it mates with the orbital reef, and clearly, or Orbital Reef is our own customer, right? right? So we're gonna make sure that we interface with them, that we have all of the capability on there so that the Dream Chaser can meet. We talked about Shooting Star. Um, we will continue every single mission. We burn that up on reentry, so we know we have to build multiple Shooting Stars into this facility. And then we have Dream Chaser back there. We call that our UDC, our Uncrewed Dream Chaser. Give my distraction. I'm looking at it Absolutely. right now. You guys will get to look at it here <laughs> a little bit later on. This is tenacity. Um, so what we're doing right now is a pretty significant operation. We're moving our vehicle right now to get it ready for some of the testing that is required prior to us going on for launch. So the team's right now very carefully picking it up, moving it around, and putting it into the text fixture. Um, you can see the wings are on the vehicle and in the deployed state right now, but we also fold those in. So we've proved out that the folding wing fixture deploys as it's supposed to. And that was a significant milestone for us because um, there are no other space vehicles that deploy wings. Right, so this was something that we're gonna be different than the rest of the vehicle.
when you saw the ETA in there, you saw the windows. We don't have windows anymore. Right. And then you can also see those black pieces of the vehicle. Those are the tiles going on there, the thermal protection system. Okay. So whenever we wrap up one area of production, as long as the space is available, we'll start putting our thermal protection system on now so that we don't have to wait to the very end to put them all on at once. I mean, to the casual observer, you know, and I'm looking at it, it's utterly covered, you know. Um, can, you, can, you, can you tell me a little bit about, I mean, you know, obviously it looks different, you know, it's covered in, in all these little tiles and, and such. Is that for security purposes? Is that for manufacturing? So What's going on with that? A lot of what you see on there right now is instrumentation that we've laid all over the vehicle so that when we do all this test, we're gathering the data that we need to. So that's why it's outfitted the way it is right now. Um, and so when it starts really looking like the videos of Tenacity is when we finish putting all the tiles on. And those tiles kind of make it look that, that black and white scheme that you're used to seeing. Right, right. Um, right now, since we're going to be moving it around a lot, testing it out, we don't need that TPS on there right now. So it's easier for to keep our instrumentation as is. Gotcha, gotcha. It's, it's difficult for me to just walk away from it, <laughs> even, even from this distance, even with the, uh, the view partially obstructed and, and all that sort of thing. It's still an amazing thing to look at. Can you tell me any of the specific tests that still remain before this thing is truly flight worthy? Um, sure, yeah. So these are the typical tests almost every vehicle is going to go through. We do modal tests, we do static tests, we're going to do some bending tests. When we uh, will end up going up and doing a lot of environmental tests, go in our thermal vac chamber. Once we're confident in our design and that everything's tested out the way it should be is when we'll ship it down to Kennedy Space Center and get her loaded up on a vehicle and ready to go. You know my people are going to ask when? What do you think? When do you think it'll be ready in your opinion? No. Need to be shipped. This whole team is working every hour 24-7. Um, we have 24-7 operations going on right now to make that launch window so early next year. So we're looking so we're, we're not looking fourth quarter this year anymore probably but the 1q 2023 probably yeah oh absolutely so our launch window actually starts in like november 30th through the end of february mm -hmm. i would put us middle of the launch window mm, somewhere in there so yeah. right around the new year a little bit after yeah. perhaps gotcha gotcha It's very exciting to be uh, to be see, seeing this. Uh, I'll tell you, and I, I, I certainly hope the uh, the viewers get an opportunity to, to, to see some more details. But this is this is amazing, and I am I can't tell you how appreciative I am. Yeah. This, is, this is astonishing. No, we've got a great team out here. I'm happy to brag on the progress that they're making. I don't blame you a little <laughs> bit. It's amazing, quite amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. And in case you're annoyed that I chopped up the footage in the midst of all of that interviewing, here's the whole thing for you. Once again, I cannot emphasize enough how impressed I am with this vehicle. It is head and shoulders, in my opinion, better than any vehicle that is currently being designed or currently in operation for the ISS. It's as simple as that. It can carry a similar amount of cargo than the 
crew dragon or rather the cargo dragon can but one of its other advantages is the fact that it can carry larger cargo and more sensitive cargo when it re-enters the atmosphere we're only talking about one and a half g's worth of stress being placed on the vehicle and by the way i got to see this vehicle right after these wings were added and during the process when they were actually moving it and putting it through an entire battery of tests so right here when they were moving it i was actually observing it um, from the window gallery to the left it was an amazing experience to say the least Plus, this vessel is capable of ISS reboost. Also, the Shooting Star gives it so much flexibility. Theoretically, a crewed version of this spaceship could have Shooting Star attached to it, carrying a significant amount of cargo, while it sent several crew members to the ISS as well. Or it could send a crew up to the ISS while the Shooting Star went on to a different mission, perhaps a mission all the way to the Lunar Gate, way. This vehicle has so much potential and so much flexibility, and although I am a big fan of Crew and Cargo Dragon, especially since those are in operation and this one isn't yet, I think that this vehicle has the potential to be the vehicle of choice, not only for NASA, but for other private spaceflight institutions that want to do business in orbit. So Sierra Space, without a doubt, is on the cutting edge of innovative space flight, of reusability, of making use of the technology we have at our disposal and pushing it to the bleeding edge to give us maximum access to low Earth orbit and beyond. How can you not applaud a company that does all of this? And by the way, a crewed version of this vehicle can theoretically fly up on the Falcon 9 as I mentioned in the past. Exciting things, thanks so much to Sierra Space. Once again, subscribe to their YouTube channel. It's linked in the description. And also there are ways to support me to ensure that I can do these sorts of things in the future. So guys, the stuff I've had the opportunity to see today has been simply stunning. It, it, it would have been more delightful if you could walk right up to the thing, but at the same time, Dream Chaser is a cutting edge, a bleeding edge piece of technology that needs to be protected. So I totally respect that. And I am so grateful to Sierra Space for giving us the opportunity to see all the things we've seen today that so many folks really don't get a chance to see. And I hope you've enjoyed the content. Stay angry! about space.